Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. We are um, going to allow people to keep joining as we start going through the slides here, but welcome. We're really excited to have you on our webinar today. We're just going to give a little bit of an overview about XPRIZE, who we are as the team running the competition, so you get a chance to know us all, and then run through some slides about the competition, and then really dig into Q&A session. So feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box all throughout. We will start answering some things um, uh, over typing while we're, while we're going, but then we'll do a live session for the rest of the for the rest of the webinar. So just to kick it off here, let me introduce the team. We have four people on the screen here who are really behind the XPRIZE carbon removal. Uh, we also are the team that ran the NRG Garcia carbon XPRIZE. So you might recognize a few of us if you were involved with that at all. Uh, my name is Nikki Batchelor. I am the prize director. I do a lot of our operations work and partnerships. Uh, Marcus Extervor, he's our VP of Energy and Climate at XPRIZE. You've probably seen him giving some talks or interviews out there in the world. Michael Leach is our technical lead. He will be going through a lot of the details of the competition today. And Rupa Dandamudi is our team relations specialist. She will be here answering questions, helping walk you through the registration process and other things that you might need. So just to quickly give you a little background on XPRIZE, we are a nonprofit based in Los Angeles. Um, we've been around about 20 years. We work across a number of different topic areas and our mission is really to empower humanity to achieve breakthroughs. And we do that through the mechanism of prizes. So most of our work is really around incentive prize competitions. We kind of put a number out there into the world as an incentive to get innovators to really work on tackling uh, challenges in these different domains, exploration, environment, and human equity. Uh, most of the work that this team here does is in the environment space, but we have other active competitions in different areas, so you can check those all out on our website. And um, you can see, you know, if you're interested in other things too, you can see how you might be able to enter those competitions and challenges along the way. And we also have kind of an alumni network for folks that have been competing in prizes in the past and to keep them connected and kind of involved with XPRIZE as well. So um, yeah, lots of different programs going. I think we have this next slide here, which is just um, some numbers around how many prizes we've launched and awarded, how much money we've really dealt with over the years. And I think it's significant here to note that the XPRIZE carbon removal is definitely the largest competition we've ever run. It's also really the largest private prize competition in history, so we're excited about that. Um, also with the opportunity that brings to have an impact on climate change. So that's why we're all here and we are going to dig into the details of that competition. Um, just so you have a sense of kind of the big picture here. So for your competition, we will be awarding money over the course of the four years. Um, we've really tried to front load some significant funding in the first year of the competition. We will talk quite a bit about that today so that people understand kind of what you need to do to prepare your submissions. The first uh, funding that's available is the $5 million in student awards. Um, that is for student teams that are competing in the competition with carbon removal solutions. There's also an additional kind of funding pool available for MRV uh, and reporting tool solutions. So that's kind of also to advance the space of carbon removal, but you know, kind of supportive infrastructure, so not the direct carbon removal solution um, itself. So Mike will talk a bit about that um, coming up. And then the next kind of tranche of funding will be in April of 2022, so not that far away. We'll be giving away the first $15 million in milestone awards. We're really excited about this because we want to ensure that really promising demonstrations actually have funding to move forward. Million dollar awards are pretty significant. XPRIZE hasn't awarded that large of funding for milestone awards in the past, but we wanna make sure that we really get some great carbon removal demos off the ground. Um, the judges will be kind of looking at all the submissions that come in for that and picking you know, their, their top 15 based on the evaluation criteria that we'll talk about in a little bit. 
And then we kind of go into a period where teams get to develop their solutions and dig into their technologies and ideas over the next couple of years and then come back together and submit their final um, data and progress um, for consideration for the grand prizes, which are $80 million remaining. We will have one large grand prize winner for $15 million and then up to three runners up with the remaining 30 million. That is some discretion with the judges. So let's dig into what it what it takes to compete in the prize. Um, oh, just quickly, a small note on some of the impact programs that we are making sure you know, we're building out a platform really around this prize. Um, this list will continue to grow and expand. I actually think we have a new one to add uh, that was just launched. Um, but quickly, the Air Miners Creative Destruction Lab Launchpad Accelerator is a great resource for teams who are in the really early stages. They've developed a six week um, program for teams to really work through their ideas and have access to resources in the carbon removal space. Air Miners is an amazing community online that really connects on Slack, um, but they have uh, resources across every topic you could possibly want in carbon removal, funding opportunities, job postings, all kinds of things. So if you're not familiar with that and a part of it, definitely sign up for the community and check out the launch pad to see if it is a good fit for you. And then the Circular Carbon Network is another initiative that we started at XPRIZE during our last um, Energy Pussy of Carbon X Prize, where we're really gathering market intelligence on carbon tech, carbon removal, all everything in between, and trying to help um, profile all the companies in the space. We've been tracking the growth and the number of startups related to carbon um, over the last five plus years. And you know, we've tried to assemble a network of investors that are interested in this space, and we have a deal hub where we profile active fundraising deals. So if you are trying to raise money for your company, which I imagine most of you are, definitely put your information up on the Circular Carbon Network and submit your deal to the Deal Hub so that we send it out to our um, network of investors. Okay, over to Mike. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, my mute button was buried behind a question window for a moment. Uh, so I apologize for the short delay. Uh, welcome, everybody. So I'm going to be talking about some of the technical nuances of the XPRIZE carbon removal. Please feel free to continue asking questions in the Q&A box, and we'll have, uh, we should have plenty of time to address uh, those at the end of the session here. So um, first of all, if you uh, haven't already, I would encourage you to go to our website, xprize.org, and download the guidelines. And the guidelines explain all of this stuff that I'm about to talk about uh, in great detail. Um, but first and foremost, what is in scope for this competition? The whole point of this competition is to reward projects that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it in a durable way. And beyond that, almost anything is in scope. The important points are that the solutions must be carbon negative. That's on a cradle to grave basis. So the whole, the whole project, the whole, if you draw a box around the whole project, um, it really does need to be carbon negative. The carbon dioxide that's sequestered needs to be sequestered durably in order to count. And, um, and uh, really the solution, any, anything under the sun is, um, is, uh, is, is, open, um, is open to compete in the competition. We talk about these uh, technologies in these kind of four tranches or four tracks, but it's important to remember that everybody's competing with everybody in this competition. So um, when you register for the competition, you're gonna be asked, you know, which do you identify with? Air, ocean, land, or rocks? But that isn't really putting people into uh, into any specified tracks. Um, that's just for us to help keep track of who is uh, joining and what kind of projects um, are entering the competition. Um, and we use those four tracks just to help us talk about different nuances between the different types of technology that we expect to see. But frankly, we would love to see other ideas that are uh, combinations or uh, blending ideas from these different tracks 
or maybe there's other solutions that we haven't even thought of that nobody's seen before um, that folks might want to get off the ground um, and enter into the competition. Um, you can go to the next slide, Rupa. So what are we actually asking you to do? We're asking teams to do three things specifically. First of all, build and run a working demonstration. Now, over the course of the next four years, um, we're, we're asking for different uh, demonstrations at, at different sort of scales or levels of maturity, for lack of a better word. Um, in phase one of the competition, we only require a proof of concept. And um, what we mean by proof of concept is outlined in more detail in the prize guidelines. But in phase two of the competition, in order to be eligible for the grand prize money, we wanna see projects that are removing a net, uh, a net rate of CO2 reduction of a thousand tons per year. That's metric tons, and that's a thousand tons per year. The second thing we will ask, or we're asking teams to do is present a fully considered cost of their solution in dollars per ton, that's metric tons, at a scale of one megaton per year. So we uh, don't require demonstrations at this scale, certainly, but we want to see, uh, we want to see teams um, outline a scenario where their solution is removing at that large scale of one megaton per year and give us an idea of what that would cost. And finally, teams need to make a case for how their technology or how their solution is going to scale up to a gigaton and beyond, because that's really what it's all about. And that's what we need to get to as a society um, over the next few years is removing at that massive scale of gigaton per year. Next slide, Rupa. In terms of how the teams will be evaluated and judged and ultimately uh, how the award decisions are made, um, we're gonna be looking at, at each of those three things that I just described. So first of all, on your demonstration, what was the performance of the demonstration, demonstrated solution. Um, we're going to be looking at things very holistically. In phase one of the competition, it's actually up to each team to secure their own verification. So we wanna see each team find a, a, a credible third party to look at their technology and sort, of, and sort of certify that it works as intended. But in the second round of the competition for the full scale solutions, um, we will be, uh, we'll be sending uh, a, a team of experts into the field to verify each of the finalists. The second thing that you're gonna be evaluated on is the sustainability of your solution and the scalability of your solution. So, um, so, so this aligns with that, that idea of massive uh, gigaton scale uh, development of, of the technologies. And we're gonna be interested in the durability of the carbon dioxide that's being sequestered we're going to be interested in, in assessing the net negativity, making sure that the systems as a whole are in fat net, fat net negative. And then we're going to be looking at those factors that might prevent uh, solutions from reaching that massive gigaton scale. Third and finally, we are going to be looking at the cost. So, so looking at that cost calculation, like I said, that's going to be for a hypothetical solution at a megaton scale. And, um, and uh, um, you know, basically looking at that cost and, and uh, lower cost solutions are going to do better um, in the competition. Next, next slide, please. So how is this all rolling out? This fall, we will be accepting proposals from student teams. And, um, and uh, at, by the end of this year, we're going to be distributing um, up to $5 million in grants to student teams. So those submissions are due on October 1st. We're going to talk about the student teams at the end of this presentation, um, but it's important to note that at this point in time, we don't require any physical demonstration. So it really is just for a proposal um, about how students are going to compete in the rest of the X Prize carbon removal. In February of 2022, that's next February, we'll be asking for uh, milestone submissions, and using these milestone submissions, we'll be awarding 15 million dollars. Um, that's 15 prizes of $1 million each to uh, the best milestone submissions. At that point in time, we are looking for demonstrations of uh, the key component of your solution that can be at any scale or any size, but we want to kind of see that proof of concept. And we're also going to be asking for a technical proposal for how you're going to build that solution out into a fully realized 1,000 ton per year system over the next few years. 
We'll also be asking for a cost model and some rationale around sustainability. And like I said, we'll be giving the best proposals uh, $1 million and we have 15 of those awards to give out. We then have a couple of years, I'm sorry, Rupa, you can go back. We have a couple of years for teams to develop their, um, their large scale solutions. Uh, one back, please. Not the other way. Sorry, gang, a little bit of technical difficulty, but I'll just keep, I'll keep on my speech. So in, in 20, by 2024, we require teams to have their solutions built out at that thousand ton per year scale. And uh, we will be awarding up to 30 teams site visits. And that, that means we're going to be coming into the field and we'll be bringing our experts with us to do, uh, to do our due diligence on up to 30 solutions. And of those 30, uh, we will be in our, those 30 teams will be invited to submit into the final round of the competition for consideration for the grand prizes. Um, that, and the grand prizes will be awarded in 2025. So um, uh, that's kind of the broad arc of the competition. Now we're gonna, we're, I, I just wanted to, to talk about the student competition a little bit because that's the first major mile, milestone. So first of all, who is eligible to submit for the student awards? Um, student teams can be formed out of existing research groups or student clubs. Student teams can also be independently incorporated. So there isn't a requirement that you sort of live on campus, um, as it were. Uh, you, you could choose to, um, you know, collaborate with, with students at other institutions or, um, and, and, you know, you may opt to incorporate independently. But student teams must be student-led and composed of, uh, of at least 50% students. Now, when we say students, we are talking about young people. And I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, mature learners out there. And, uh, you know, I'm one of them. And, uh, you know, I consider myself a lifelong learner, but we are targeting younger people specifically with these student awards. And so we're asking for, for students who are uh, 35 or younger and currently enrolled at an educational institution for the 2021-2022 academic year or recently graduated um, from, from school in the 20, you know, in 2021. We are asking student teams to identify an academic advisor or a business leader who will act as a formal mentor to the team. And we are asking for a letter of support from an academic institution. So even if you are independently incorporated, we wanna see some association with an academic institution. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be giving out up to $5 million this fall. We, have, uh, we actually have two categories of awards that we'll be giving out awards up to $250,000 a piece for student teams who are going to compete in the XPRIZE carbon removal. So those proposals, we're actually looking for proposals where, where students are gonna build out carbon removal solutions and compete alongside everyone else in the prize. And, and these awards are really just intended to be seed money for that. We're also giving out awards of up to $100,000 for student teams who are developing measurement, reporting and verification technologies. And our definition of those technologies is pretty broad. Again, you can look at the guidelines online, but any, any kind of technology that helps further the cause of carbon removal is eligible for these awards of up to $100,000. And as I mentioned, those proposals are due on October 1st. So how do you register for all of this? Visit our website at xprize.org slash carbon removal. Um, there you'll find uh, two things. You'll find the guidelines, which I would encourage you to download and read very carefully. You'll also find a, um, a link to the prize operations platform, which Rup is going to talk, talk about, and that's where you register uh, for the competition. Okay, thanks, Mike. So as Mike mentioned, the prize operations platform is where you register to compete. That's the main hub for XPRIZE carbon removal and all our challenges and prizes. Um, this is where all your team information is stored. It's where you will submit your, um, you know, upload your submissions. Um, and it's also going to be used by our judges to view your submissions. 
So the way you do that and the way you register for the competition is on our main website, you go to the register now button, click that, and that should take you to pop.xprize.org. You're gonna need to um, select don't have an XPRIZE account, register if you, if you don't. And then you'll need to confirm your email um, and you know, then you'll have an account. Once you're able to log in, you're going to be requested to fill in a user profile. This is how you will access POP um, from now on. And it's just your basic information. None of this is used for um, anything beyond you know, setting up your profile. So you'll fill out this form and select XPRIZE carbon removal from the interests category. And once you do that, you're in. So once you get into POP, you go to the prizes page and select XPRIZE carbon removal, which is highlighted here, and you click create a team. <clears throat> That's where you'll um, be required to, you know, complete the registration activities. Once you're logged in, you'll see um, under activities, you'll see everything that kind of remains for you to complete. So for registration, it's completing the team registration form, uh, making the payment and signing the competitor's agreement. So the registration form, um, that's going to be a form that's gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Um, you know, like you see here, this is the beginning of the form. Um, just want to really stress that none of this information is used for judging or evaluation, um, anything like that. We've gotten a number of concerned emails um, that they need to change uh, something they wrote or update it. This is really just for us to get a lay of the land on, you know, the competitor landscape, who's who's interested, who's competing, that sort of thing. So it's not used for anything, um, you know, that will um, help you or hurt you. Um, the next step uh, after the form and payment is signing the competitor's agreement. This is sort of the legally binding document for competitors in X price competitions. Um, I'd really make sure you take a careful look at it. Um, and it also contains some information that, you know, could answer some of your questions as well. So if you need technical support, you email pop support at xprize.org. So you can also use the POP portal to find other team members. So say you are someone who doesn't have a team. Once you have the POP uh, account, you can log in, um, you know, go to the competitions page and then select teams. That's where you can kind of search for a team that you already know of, or you can search for teams who are accepting new team members, um, looking for skills like material science, chemical engineering, that sort of thing. Um, you're looking for teams that are fully registered to join. So once you kind of filter through all that, all the teams that meet those criteria will show up. And you can click one of them and select apply to team. And it's not really a formal application. It's actually applying to, you know, get in contact with the team lead. So there you'll put in, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so, I have a PhD in materials engineering and I've been working in such and such area for however long and I'm really interested in, you know, your approach to your solution. Um, looks like you're uh, accepting new team members. I'd love to join. Can we talk further? Provide your email, any other information you want, and then the team lead can accept to um, contact you. So the team lead will make, uh, get a message like this and go in and see your message and they can accept or reject it. So I just wanna point out some really important resources uh, that, that uh, Mike had also mentioned earlier. First things first is really download the competition guidelines. If you're interested, download them, look at the requirements, um, see you know, where your solution might fit or maybe it doesn't fit. Um, read the FAQ. Uh, there's an FAQ section here. Um, I just got a couple of questions today with exact answers to their questions in the FAQ. <laughs> so um, I linked them right back to it because uh, we try to you know, update these regularly. Um, these are based on some of the most common questions we've been getting through POP or through our um, carbon removal email. Um, you can also view our past webinars and look for a schedule of upcoming webinars on the upcoming events and webinars page. 
And then lastly, contact us at carbonremoval at xprize.org if you have uh, other questions. So some upcoming events to get on your radar. We have a matchmaking session. We had our first matchmaking session um, about, ooh, a, about a month ago. And um, it was pretty well received. We got to hear for, from some teams that are looking for new team members. Um, these sessions are also gonna allow you a chance to kind of network with them in breakout sessions and that sort of thing. So we've um, sent out in our last newsletter uh, a link to apply to pitch um, and also an RSVP link to join the webinar. You can also access that here under our events page. Um, so that's coming up next week. So a week from uh, today, I, I believe, yeah. Um, so the team Q&A webinars that are, we are holding such as today's, um, those are gonna be bi-weekly. So those are gonna be a regular thing from now on um, because I think you know there's gonna be lots of questions uh, to come. And so we wanna keep, keep this regular to provide teams a chance to ask us um, IRL. Um, the next webinar we have is for students. That's um, preparing a winning carbon X, uh, carbon, preparing a winning X Prize carbon removal student project application. We're going to have past carbon X Prize judges on um, to just kind of talk about their experience um, evaluating, uh, you know, submissions and applications and things like that. That's coming up on August twenty fourth, and then the next team Q and A webinar is September first at nine a.m. So again, how to contact us. We've got subsidium questions about the competition, carbon removal at xprize.org, and for tech support issues like you're locked out of your account or you need to make changes, um, pop support at xprize.org is the best place to look. So let's get into the Q&A. Okay. Feel free to uh, type any questions into the Q&A box. Um, Note that we've uh, we've typed answers to a few of the questions that came in during the uh, during the presentation, and um, we Thanks. can uh, answer some of these live. Okay, uh, question from Ramona: um, You're having trouble with the pop portal. Whenever you try to sign in your profile, it keeps redirecting to the sign in sign up page. Um, first thing I would say is contact the pop portal. It looks like you've sent an email, but have no reply. Um, contact carbon removal at xprize.org and in the subject line say pop access issues. I'll just need your team name and the email associated with the account and I can make sure that you get help with that, okay? Okay. So there's a question here from Christopher around uh, biomass solutions. And Christopher says the final rules say that biomass based solutions cannot utilize old growth forests or reduce total standing biomass, which is understandable and appropriate. Are there any best practices suggested for obtaining lignin based woody biomass in a way that the judges would consider to be sustainable? So this is a very good question. Um, obviously the issue around uh, ecosystem preservation and sort of doing no harm is, uh, is something that, that we really tried to emphasize in the prize design and in the prize guidelines. Fundamentally, it is up to each team to make the case around the sustainability of their practices. And specifically, I think we're, we're um, you know, in the guidelines, we, we, we spoke about not reducing total standing biomass. I think, I think we're also, um, very, uh, very aware, or the, the judges are going to be very aware of the um, effects of these projects on overall total biodiversity. Um, but those two statements are very broad and I think very nuanced depending on where you are developing your project. And so I don't have a firm answer for you, but I think it, it, um, it would be best uh, to consult some of the sustainability uh, organizations in the area of the world where you're competing in and make sure that you reference those standards in your, in your submission. Okay, question from Ramona. Cost calculations, are they included for phase one or does it apply to phase one and student awards as well? So we're gonna be asking for cost calculations from teams in both phase one and phase two of the competition. And again, 
those cost calculations are on are going to be on a hypothetical basis of a, of a megaton scale project. Um, we are not going to be asking the uh, student teams to be submitting cost calculations as a part of the student proposal that's due on October 1st. So um, the first cost calculations will be due in February. So Igor asks, we plan uh, in the project for students to launch an installation at a scale of, of uh, one tenth scale, which will capture CO2 in the amount of a hundred tons. Is this normal for your conditions? In the future, the main project will scale to a gigaton. So I would encourage you to, uh, to certainly submit to the student competition, um, but keep in mind that the, uh, the student awards are specifically intended for teams who will, uh, who will have a, a legitimate, um, uh, a legitimate plan for competing in the main competition. And the target for the main competition is a thousand tons per year. So I think um, if if uh, if you are able to present a case for the the rapid scale up from 100 tons per year to a thousand tons per year, um, then then that might be compelling. But uh, but we really are targeting. Um, uh, projects at that thousand that that will reach the thousand ton per year scale um, by 2025. So um, having said that, I don't think there's any harm in submitting and and seeing what happens. Um, remember that this is a competition. And so uh, so you know it's uh, X prizes are awarded on the basis of uh, performance, but they're also awarded on the basis of performance relative to the the other competitors in the uh, in, in the in the competition. Okay. Um, <clears throat> question from Richard: Will X Prize be giving a recommended a recommended list of third party verification firms for the fifteen million milestone? Thanks for that question, Richard. Um, we will not be issuing a comprehensive list. Uh, we may have um, a few firms that we may uh, we may uh, name as as examples of good firms. But what we will be doing is issuing uh, more specific guidelines on what exactly we are looking for in uh, third party verification, and what the requirements of that verification are. And very broadly, um, we require the third party verifiers to be third party, that is to say independent, and also qualified um, and having some expertise in the field. Um, but but beyond that, uh, we aren't going to be um, we aren't going to be saying you know you must use this firm or that firm or or you know pick from the list. Um, we want to keep it open for all teams to uh, to um, find independent verifiers that that suit their project. Oh yeah, so Jeff asks this, almost the same question. I hope I answered this question already. Will there be more information on what is needed for third party verification? Yes, we're working on that guidance and we'll be issuing it soon. Okay, uh, question from Marnie. Are demonstration pilots that have industry sponsorship eligible and have and have started before April 2022, um, are they round one eligible? Yeah, good question. The answer is yes. Um, anyone, is, uh, is invite, anyone is invited to submit to both rounds of the competition. Um, both, both phases of the competition are open, um, which open enrollment essentially. So you can, you can register at any time before uh, that phase deadline. Um, and uh, folks who are already working in the carbon removal space and already building uh, building projects or building plants are, are eligible and, and uh, you know, in fact, ha have a little bit of a head start. So, um, so we certainly encourage folks who are new to the space to get, get, get right to work and don't waste a moment. Um, and folks that are already working in that space, um, you know, certainly keep on building things out and, um, and, uh, you know, we encourage you to orient your your uh, plans around uh, the requirements of the competition. Okay. Okay. A question from Debbie: Where? Uh, what is the expected availability for the Phase One Milestone Million Dollar Award guidelines? Uh, oh, 
I think she's asking when we're going to give sort of submission guidance on um, the milestone when we're thinking about that. Right. So we will be um, we will be publishing a uh, submission uh, template for um, for each phase of the competition. So we expect the submission template for the student awards to be um, to be published in the next few weeks. And we'll be following up very shortly thereafter with a submission template for the first phase of the main competition. So um, the best way to find out about that is to make sure you're registered for the competition, which means you'll be on our mailing list and um, you'll be notified by the POP, the prize operations platform system, once those submission uh, guidelines are, are uploaded and, and when the submissions are, are, you know, are open. So John asked a really good question. He says, most gigaton scale carbon removal te techniques are unproven and require extensive R&D to address unknown outcomes. How do you deal with the unknowns in your assessment slash judgment? One of our objectives at the XPRIZE Foundation is to design competitions that are formulated around uh, demonstrations that are, that are actually measurable. And so that's what we've tried to do here by challenging people to, um, to demonstrate uh, carbon dioxide removal projects you know, at a very significant scale in a short period of time um, that we can actually, you, know, you kind of like show up and look and see and measure and assess. And, um, and, and on, that, on that basis, um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the core of the, of the XPRIZE assessment. So, so the, 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 the biggest challenge is actually getting the job done as it were. But you make a very good point about the, gig, the gigaton scalability, how, um, how those assessments uh, rely on a lot of assumptions. And you'll see when we publish the um, submission guidelines that the, um, the, the, the questions that we ask teams to address in the submission are oriented at that. And I think everybody understands, and we know that the, the judges that, that we are recruiting for this competition understand that there's, uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty and, um, and uh, you know, we'll, be, we'll be asking the teams to speak to that uncertainty, but the judges are, are always thinking about that when, when, they, when they convene to choose a winner. So thanks for the question. Okay, question from Benjamin. Um... If two teams have a similar solution, would you defer to the more robust team for the milestone award? So, um, I mean, I think the answer is essentially yes. Um, it, it, we do expect um, several teams to be bringing similar concepts to the competition. And as I mentioned before, the core challenge of this competition is the demonstration. So really it is about the performance of that demonstration that will be uh, the main determining factor. It's not the only factor, but the main determining factor uh, in, in who's chosen to be the winner. Okay. Oh, here's a good question from Wolfgang. I am looking for a team, he says. I prepared a little presentation to explain my approach. Would you like me to present my Google Slides? Okay, this is a great question. Rupa, do you wanna talk about our, our uh, matchmaking webinars? Yeah, I get uh, many emails <laughs> asking for us to review their decks or, you know, and, and we're excited that there's so many people excited about this topic, um, but we are limited in what we can review individually and we're not really in a place to do that. Um, we're really here to operate this prize and help you in any way we can. Um, so Wolfgang, I'm not sure if you're on our mailing list or you've gotten the newsletter, but we do have a matchmaking session next week, next um, Thursday, I believe. And we are going to be hearing from teams that are registered, um, you know, to present their solution, their idea, and what kind of team members they're looking for. So um, if you haven't gotten the newsletter, contact me um, at carbonremovaletxprize.org and I can send you more information about the matchmaking session. Um, so that's kind of really the only place where we're going to be allowing teams to present to each other. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, here's a question about the phase one demonstration or the de phase one demonstration requirements. Does phase one require a demonstration or just a proof of concept? So um, the, the phase one demonstration, uh, we, we want to see demonstrations of the key component of each solution. So what that means is um, the, the, the phase one demonstration doesn't necessarily need to, to show complete end-to-end -end carbon removal. It doesn't necessarily need to be carbon negative at that, at, at that scale at that time. But we do want we want to see teams demonstrate uh, systems that provide the judges confidence in the efficacy of the overall solution. So, um, so I I think the answer is yes, a demonstration is required. But when we say proof of concept, um, we don't necessarily mean like a tiny version of the full carbon dioxide removal solution. Um, so, so take another look at the guidelines and read those very carefully. Because we tried to, you know, the, 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 the way we described that phase one demo was very, um, very specific and very intentional. Um, so I hope that answers your question. So James asks, does the XPRIZE organization really believe that CO2 removal will solve the root cause of global warming? Or is it just one step in the big picture or one of the tools in the toolbox? Man, what a question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> Rufa, Nikki? <laughs> I mean, I think it's one solution in the toolbox. It, it has, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's no way this one prize can, can, or can solve the entire global warming problem. Um, but we're- one question. Oh, sorry, Rufa, I didn't mean- No, that's, you. that's that was the gist of it. <laughs> Um, we, we get asked this question a lot and, and uh, you know, a lot of folks um, are quick to point out that, um, that uh, you know, we, we shouldn't just focus on carbon dioxide removal, but we should also focus on emissions reduction. And I think that's a really uh, important point to, to mention that we agree with that perspective. However, the science is clear and it's becoming clearer year after year that we will need massive scale carbon dioxide removal in addition to emissions reduction. And that's why this competition was scoped as it was, not as a, not as a, um, you know, a, a, a monolithic solution, but as um, a, an extremely important solution that, that, that needs to be taken in consideration with everything else at our disposal. <laughs> How was that for an answer? <laughs> It works for me. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, in, in the future, we hope to, you know, work on challenges of different areas and, you know, that sort of thing. But for now, this is our, this is our big focus. Um, Bill, let's see. Bill, um, I've looked at the seed links and they all seem to be focused on a solution that will make money. I do not feel they will be interested unless the solution makes money. However, the best solution may not. I have filled out some of the forms and was not acknowledged um, that they were even received. Um, so the, the, the competition does not require uh, teams to make money or even break even or make a profit. You know, that's, that's really not a requirement of the competition. Um, in the cost calculations, we are gonna be asking teams to, um, to outline their costs in addition to any opportunities they might have to, to make revenue. But that's, um, it's, it's not expected that teams have to make money. Um, Bill, I'm not entirely sure what you mean when you say seed links. Um, so, so feel free to, uh, to expand on that question. Maybe you can send us a direct message in the chat and we can, um, we can make sure that, uh, that you're on the, on the right path here. Okay. So there's a question from Igor, a few questions down uh, who asks, can an insurance company function as a verifier? Please let us know who can be the verifier. And so to, to answer that question, I was going to type in an answer, but, but I'll answer it live. Um, the, uh, basically, the answer is stay tuned. We are working on the guidelines for 
uh, for more more details on exactly who the verifiers can and can't be, and and exactly what's required in that verification. Um, we we aren't going to require uh, verifiers be anything, you know. Um, and an insurance company uh, who who has expertise in the solution that you're promoting um, might well be qualified to um, to provide verification services for you, but. Um, but it really kind of depends on what you're doing and who, uh, who the verifier is. So Ramona asks, uh, from my understanding, algae cultivation is mainly considered as, as capture slash sequen sequestration technology in one. Can this technology be considered only as sequestration? Uh, in this proposal, the capture will be done by um, direct air capture. Um, if there are any uh, algae folks, I'm sorry, I said algae, it might be algae. I don't, I, I always get those two confused. Um, we really hope to see some algae um, dem demonstrations in this competition. Um, the challenge with algae, of course, is the durability requirement. We do require the CO2 that's captured and sequestered be um, durably sequestered for at least 100 years. I think there's a number of ways um, that you can use algae as an intermediate towards durable sequestration. But algae in itself uh, will obviously decompose and return to the atmosphere. So I think that's the core challenge there. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but, but it's certainly, um, we would love to see you uh, uh, f find a, a sequestration solution that involves algae for sure. Okay, is third party LCA verification needed or encouraged? Um, so in the first phase of the competition, the all of the life cycle assessment and all of the cost assessment will be done by the teams and self reported. Um, we aren't going to require any third party review of the uh, of, of the of the uh, documents that you submit to the first phase of the competition. Um, but the judges will be scrutinizing those numbers. Um, if you have third party verification, um, I think that's, uh, that, that provides credibility to your case. And so, so that's a really great point. And I'm gonna discuss this with the team and we may um, include that as, a, as an, optional, uh, an optional element of the submission. Um, I hadn't really thought about that before. But in the second round of the competition, uh, there will be third party verification of the overall system in addition to uh, the LCA and some elements of the cost calculation. So, so in, in the second round of the competition, the bar will be much higher for um, both verification and for, for the, the due diligence that XPRIZE does on, on all the systems. Question from Nan. Um, it looks like you want to change what you selected um, originally on the registration form. Um, it's sort of hard to go back and change that. Uh, our tech teams, you know, received a lot of in individual requests like this. Um, as I said before, it does not make a difference um, in terms of your, um, how you'll be evaluated. Um, it's really just kind of data that we use to read the group as a whole. So I don't know if that changes your, um, you know, your, if you still want to change it. Um, if you do contact uh, pop support at xprize.org and um, see if they can help you change it. Okay, so um, Bill has uh, typed in a follow up to his question about the, the seed links, um, referencing uh -huh. some, of, some of these other um, services like decompression, launch pad, ocean solutions, etc. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
Nikki, would you like to just speak about some of those other uh, some of those other programs? Yeah, I see a clarification lower down from Bell about um, really just trying to ask what organizations would give a team seed money if they don't expect to make money down the road. I mean, that's a really important question, and I think something that all teams will need to grapple with in some way. So, you know, there is the competition that we are running and the funding that's on the table for that. But then teams also are on their own to really fundraise for kind of early R&D funding to advance their technologies and solutions. And so, you know, your strategy could take one of many forms. A lot of people are trying to come up with some sort of business model to build into their proposal where you might be able to pitch traditional investors who are looking for that. Um, for some teams that might not be possible or, you know, the direction you're going. And so in that case, maybe you're looking more for academic or grant funding from organizations that are really trying to fund um, research in this field. So it kind of depends what category you fall into. Um, some of the programs that we've mentioned, you know, like the Circular Carbon Network, we're profiling deals to investors um, that are, you know, currently raising money and, you know, Keep in mind, you are pitching to investors and private capital there, you know, so people will be looking for returns in that case. There are other funding opportunities that are available, though, through places like the Department of Energy um, and the equivalents in other countries. Um, we, I think, are going to work towards trying to compile some of those references for people down the line, just so, you know, that's a little bit easier to access. But um, then there are the other programs like Air Miners Launchpad, and then I think maybe you were trying to reference Ocean Visions um, new Launchpad, which is also another kind of early stage support program for ocean based solutions. Um, I don't know if there is funding attached with that at the end, so you definitely need to look at the accelerator program specifically, but some of them do offer funding opportunities kind of at the end of completing the program, and others are more just mentorship and, you know, um, program development, customer discovery, that kind of thing. So all of it's valuable, but it kind of depends on the specific um, portfolio of support that you need to get your solution to the next level. Okay, thanks, Nikki. Um, so question from Brett, would DAC tech, which enables both carbon removal and emission reduction um, rank higher because emissions reduction uh, counts as a co-benefit? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So it's important to remember that the uh, eligible solutions must be carbon negative on a cradle to grave base, on a cradle to grave basis, excuse me, and they and the, the the carbon that's sequestered must be sourced from the air or the surface layer of the ocean. So so um, as long as you're doing that, you're eligible. Now, if you're also reducing emissions uh, elsewhere, um, that certainly is an interesting co-benefit that um, we would we would love to see you make a, a case for in your submission. Now, uh, whether it's um, whether those solutions will be ranked more more favorably uh, is is really hard to say because it depends on the the effectiveness of the system as a whole. So I can't I can't say that um, it would be treated preferentially in any way. It, it really wouldn't be, um, but it would be uh, taken taken into consideration alongside all of the other requirements, the competition that are outlined in the guidelines. Great question. Question, question from Benjamin, are we free to sell our sequestered carbon dioxide in this project to companies to offset some of our costs as long as they are still sequestered? Hmm. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Uh, as long as the carbon remains uh, durably sequestered, um, you know, and, and that carries with it an obligation to, uh, to, to you know, ensure and verify that the carbon remains sequestered for for a hundred years. Um, but the uh, but the answer is yes, and we don't have any uh, requirements or limitations really for how teams might um, either raise funds or or make money through through these through these projects. So you're um, absolutely um, absolutely uh, able to and encouraged to um, come up with a unique. Uh, business models to to help further solutions. Okay. 
So Dawson asks about how, if teams don't have to make money, how will you measure scalability from a solution that makes money versus a company that needs government help? So this is kind of like a tricky question, isn't it? Um, uh, the objective of this competition is to highlight high quality, low cost solutions. Um, if solutions can in fact be profitable, that's a, that's a win, as long as it's also high quality and, and you know, legitimately removing carbon. Um, so, so, I mean, that's our, that was our perspective when we designed and scoped out the prize. And that's the perspective that uh, the judges will be uh, making their award decisions on. So I know that's maybe not a, not a, not a direct answer to the question, but I hope that kind of um, gets, gets at the answer. Um, there's no requirement to make money, but certainly it's an advantage um, if you can. Okay, question. Oh, Igor asked a question about intellectual property here. Mm -hmm. The question is, there have been developed unique projects and technologies that are unpatented. We would like to share them with others, but fear that unfair and dishonest people can later patent inventions and prohibit their use. What's the solution? Well, um, I, I, it's, I, I can't really speak to patent law because I'm not a patent lawyer. If you have a specific piece of technology that you think needs, needs uh, intellectual property protection, I would encourage you to speak to an IP lawyer, an intellectual property lawyer about that. Um, uh, I think to answer the question is if you publish uh, the technology openly, in most cases, as far as I'm aware, it should not be able to be patented if, if, a, if a technology is already public, public knowledge. Um, um, but I would, I would definitely suggest you, um, you seek professional uh, opinion on, on that question. Okay, Ramona asked, does a student team need third party verification too? So remember that student teams are, um, the, the intention for the student awards is that there's to see teams that will compete in phase one and phase two of XPRIZE carbon removal. So third party verification isn't required at the time of the student submission, but it will be required in the later phase of the competition. The requirements for the students to submit to phase one and phase two are exactly the same as every other team in the competition. Okay, Milan, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Milan asks, since we have only sequestration and transformation portion of the process, can it be coupled with an already existing capture process to complete the whole loop? Um, the answer is yes. Um, we want to see demonstrations that show the full process, but you are welcome to partner with other organizations or in fact other teams in the competition to make that happen. So over the next few years, I, I really hope that, that um, you, know, you might be able to find a partner who can provide the capture uh, solution that complements your sequestration technology. Um, Buddy asks, is documented history considered third party? Um, we want to see evidence that uh, demonstrations are, are currently running. Um, I think documentation history is part of a good verification, but, um, but not the only part. Um, so I think that definitely helps, um, you know, and, and verification reports that have already been uh, uh, published can certainly help your case there. Um, that's a good question. I, I think um, uh, I'll take that into consideration certainly and we'll, um, we'll incorporate that feedback in the uh, verification uh, guidelines that are due to come out uh, later this summer. Okay, here's a question about, um, can we make uh, an, can we make another person the leader for a team who's not signed the competitor agreement? So I think this question is about um, <clears throat> who needs to sign the competitor agreement on behalf of a team and can that team leader change over time? Nikki Arupa, can you speak to that? 
Um, usually it's sort of, you know, who signs the competitor agreement. Sometimes if it's a university um, or, you know, some other organization or company, that's where the, you know, winnings will go. Um, so they, they have to match. Um, I would like to get back to you on that because I think um, most of the time we've had the team leads be the people that sign the competitor agreement. So um, I will, Abhishek, uh, type a contact you can send to me, uh, contact email you can reach me at. So somebody asks about um, protecting the IP of a team when adding new members. Um, this is a really good question. And IP is, is certainly a sensitive topic. Um, the answer is that each team kind of has to manage their own team members and manage their own uh, intellectual property themselves. And so if you, if you as a team decide you need to, to uh, you know, have confidential, confidentiality provisions confidentiality agreements signed amongst yourselves, you can do that. We don't have any requirements or, or even any guidance there. What I can say is that XPRIZE goes to great lengths to protect your IP and does not disclose IP broadly beyond the, um, the, the staff and the judges who are managing the competition. So, you know, we'll, we will protect any intellectual property that you, that you submit to us. Um, but you're kind of on your own in terms of protecting your own IP amongst your amongst your, yourselves and your members. Um, so Joseph asks actually a, 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 a good follow up to that question, which is um, if there are intellectual property implications with the judges and evaluators from XPRIZE be open to signing non disclosure agreements. So the, uh, the competitor agreement that you sign when you register for the competition does include uh, confidentiality and non-disclosure provisions. And uh, all of the uh, staff at XPRIZE and all of the judges and all of the independent contractors that we hire to run the competition um, will sign uh, strong confidentiality agreements. Um, if there are specific concerns around uh, IP that, that require, uh, you know, uh, additional agreements, um, that's something that I think we would have to evaluate on a case by case basis. Um, but we're of the opinion that the confidentiality provisions uh, written into the competitor agreement are, are very strong. Okay, how can I get a mentor's support? This is a question from Igor. Um, there are cultural language and financial differences uh, and that our aim is that an effective project becomes successful and does not fail because of communication problems. How can I get a mentor's support? Um, Rupa, Nikki, do you have any ideas uh, on this? Well, Mike, I'm thinking maybe the most recent student energy webinar that we did might be a good resource. Um, I think there was uh, some lessons learned from finalist teams on the carbon, the energy COSIA Carbon X Prize that were based out of universities, and they kind of talked about their experiences um, working within the university system, looking for mentors and coaches to work with, um, and also some advice from the student energy team on guides that they've put together. Uh, so I think that we can put the link to that recording in here for you to look at. Um, but, you know, in general, we encourage folks to get mentors, you know, in across a number of different fields. So looking for industrial partners and people who are already working on, you know, similar things within the industry, reaching out to them, trying to see if you can create some sort of partnership or mentorship, um, and then, you know, advisors within universities and um, maybe in the accelerator world, if you're really looking for a lot of mentorship, I would strongly encourage like applying to a program where that's more structured that you'll get support and access to a network. Um, so some of the ones that we mentioned earlier would definitely be a good place to start and the air miners community as well. You can um, definitely put um, kind of calls out into that community for what your needs are and you might get some, some bites back that way. Uh, 
Um, here's a question. Are student teams allowed to cooperate with each other? Um, yes, uh, we'd love to see teams cooperate with each other. Um, there's, it's a competition, but certainly we love to see uh, teams get together and share ideas and share expertise. We've also seen over the years that some teams decide to merge or perform or um, uh, conduct partnerships over the years because you might realize that you are really strong in one area, but you're kind of missing the other piece of the puzzle. So I think we actually had um, some conversation about that in the chat earlier, you know, someone who has one piece of their carbon removal solution looking for the other piece. So we don't expect that everybody has everything right off the bat and we are trying to create a community here where folks can find each other. So we definitely encourage, encourage um, cooperation and collaboration. And yeah, if you really, you know, are putting your word out there, we think that people, people will bite and you can search through the pop platform for other teams that are looking for team members and try and, you know, sort by different skill sets and, you know, um, carbon removal pathways or things like that to, to narrow in on maybe what you're looking for. Okay, well, I think we are actually at the bottom of the Q and A list. Yeah, and uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, we're we're a little bit over time, but um, but thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Rupa, do you want to play us out? Yeah, I think um, please join us for some of the um, upcoming events. Check our events page for what webinars are next. Uh, we'll be putting the recording for this up soon. And um, stay tuned for our newsletter for other updates. But yeah, hope to see you on the next one. Thanks all.